Dr. Prido, Paul, <laughs> is one of my great, great teachers. And I regard him as a brother from another mother living in Miami. <laughs> Thinking about him always uh, makes me smile. <laughs> Uh, I learned uh, penile procedure from him, and uh, Paul and I, I believe, we are the, one of the uh, Dr. Wilson surrogate sons. So he has a very unique point of view, uh, thinking about the other, you know, stuffs. So um, when he think about uh, talks about the penile process surgery, many people only talks about his own practice, but Paul does not. Paul is, does not talking about just his surgery. He talks about something bigger, you know, penal process market itself and how to make it bigger and how to do it better. Something like that is uh, uh, his character. But at the same time, he has a very strong character. So many men, I mean, I would say, be fooled by his uh, macho bravado character, but actually he's not. He's a very considerate person, just like his surgery does. So if you look at his surgery, it's a very quick and slick surgery. He made it look so easy. But actually, uh, in my eyes, it's the just ingenious city. Polish it with uh, tons of cases. So Paul uh, is a very considerate man. Um, but don't be fooled by his uh, <laughs> outlooks, muscular outlooks. Um, I always wish that I could invite him again to South Korea so that I can learn more from him. Mm, his uh, mentality, his surgery, and all the other thing else, I got to learn more from him. Uh, just, I can't stop wait to see him again and learn from him again. For my, my practice as well, for the other practices as well, he's a true blessing to just many of our prosthetic surgeons, uh, at the same time, many of the patients. That's how I see Paul Prida. That, that's a great question. Uh, first thing and foremost, there's no doubt that, that, that sexual intimacy is probably number one over and above a psychological relationship, if you look at it. So, so, so the, the career that Dr. Park and I have devoted ourselves to is, is more meaningful to couples than anything else in their life in general. The, the second thing is, is why, why dedicate yourself to the surgical treatment of, of erectile dysfunction? I don't know if you are aware of this, but the, the very first treatment for erectile dysfunction was a penile implant. This is more than 40 years ago because back then they thought that 80% of people had psychological problems and there was 20%, usually the paraplegics or something like that, that had real physiologic erectile dysfunction. So, so it started, the, the first treatment was a penile implant. And then what, what came along since then? We've seen pills, PD-5 inhibitors, we've seen shots into the penis that have come along. So th there's been all these adjuncts to the surgical treatment, which are clearly less invasive, more conservative, and easy to do. But when it comes to the actual treatment of true erectile dysfunction, and the, the reason that we do an implant is because they failed pills and they failed shots. So, so, so what, what turns us on about it is yes, it is a very, it's, it, it's a case with a, a lot of nuance. And I, I truly believe until somebody's done one to 200 cases that they, they don't have any idea what they're doing. And hopefully they're doing those one to 200 cases with people that have had you know, similar experiences previously. But it, it really is, it's one of the most challenging cases that we can do. But, you know, go, go back to what I first said. That was the first treatment for penile, for erectile dysfunction. And, and it's, it's probably the most gratifying one from a surgeon's standpoint because it is a case with such nuance. So, so we have a conference, the Sexual Medicine Conference. And still, to this day, even though it was the first treatment for erectile dysfunction, the surgical treatment for, for, for erectile dysfunction is still considered 
very much a niche market. And let me give you a great example. So in the US last year, there was 300,000 breast implants placed in the US. In, in the world, in the world, there was only 18,000 inflatable penile prostheses. And I've done 500 and Sean, I think, did 250. Dr. Park did 250. So he, he, this, this is an injury, industry that has really not been tapped. And I do blame that on my colleagues and we all blame it on ourselves that we have not, we have not either trained people adequately or not spread the word that it really, when, you're, when you reach that point, it is the best, safest, most efficacious way of treating erectile dysfunction. And those numbers, <laughs> breast implants, penile implants, if you got 40 million men who have erectile dysfunction in the US, at least several million should have a penile implant. That's why I keep coming to these meetings, because someday, someday it will be as ubiquitous as breast implants. That question is biased and, and, and it's loaded because we're assuming that it's stigmatized everywhere in the US. It's definitely not. And I'm from the Northeast. Yes, in the Northeast, very few people talk about it. I now live in Miami where there's a large Latin culture and there is absolutely no, no, no qualms in discussing erectile dysfunction. So it, it, it's very much a geographic thing. I'm not sure about in Seoul, I'm pretty sure from what I understand from Dr. Park that they're fairly open about it, but it's geographic, it's cultural, and it's something that one of the reasons that we come to these meetings is to continue to break down these, these barriers to people talking about something that is, and the thing I love to tell patients is like, let's go back to the history. Everybody thought it, Previously, 80% of it was psychological. That's not true. 90% of it is physiologic. So once they understand that it's physiologic, all the barriers break down. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, gay, straight, uh, Christian, Jewish. There's no barriers once they understand that it's physiologic. So I, I, I think that once, once, once we educate people that it's a physiologic in general, phenomenon, those barriers will all be breaking down, broken down. The last 10 years, my practice, my practice, you heard that term, practice, not me, I'll never say me, it's my practice, has done more than anybody in the world, year after year after year. And, and you really have to, you have to look at it as, yeah, you're the captain of the ship, but I have the most amazing team on the planet. So what, what's the secret? What, whether it's my scrub tech, my nurse, uh, the, the, the anesthesiologist, the, 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 the guys that come and train with me. You know, everybody that comes into this team has a, a, an algorithm and a model that we follow to the T every time. Just like when you wake up in the morning, right? You shave the same way every single time. We do an implant the same way every single time. Now, I already told you, it's a case with great nuance, and that's where you know, you, your, your experience and you know, all these great people that have come and trained with me, I've learned from them, they learn from me. And you, you get better at meeting small obstacles, but you do it the same way every single time with the same team every single day, and for some reason it's not boring. It's enjoyable, and the outcomes are they're, 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 they're really good, they're really good. I like having guys come to where I am better than going to where they are. Because I, first I would like for them to come and see me and my team because without my team I'm nothing. You're as good as the weakest link of your team. And then, then I could go and to where they are and, and help, help that male or female urologist, you know, build, help build their team. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the way I see things in, as we've been doing it now, is they come down, they work with me and my team, and then we go and we try to duplicate it at, at, at their facility because that it is. It's, it's a tried and true algorithm that works 99% of the time.
I was hoping you would ask that. <laughs> I, I, okay, so I don't know if you realize, how, how many guys do you think I've trained? 400. Over, Dana, probably over 400. So I've, I've trained over 400 guys. Um, there, there's a few things that you look at. You look at their fund of knowledge, you look at their hands, their skills, and, that, and then you, you, you look at their ability to, to, to see things as they should be in the future. And I could tell you that, and I'm not patronizing Dr. Park, he, he's a guy who had all three things and all three things at the highest level. Great surgical skills, great fund of knowledge. His fund of knowledge built by his own doing because he took you know, his time, his family time, his money and everything to go and train with everybody to learn different things. And, and he, he's been able to incorporate all three of those things, good hands, good fund of knowledge, and good, good look into the future that this kid, and I call him a kid, because he is, he could, I, I could almost be his dad, but the guy, the guy really is, he's the future of prosthetic urology that I, that I see. And I've seen a lot of them.